Property Insights, a podcast about the future of property and construction in Melbourne. Brought to you by South Melbourne Business Community and sponsored by SiteTech. Hi and welcome to Property Insights. My name is Eric. This podcast is the fourth episode in a series that discusses the future of property and construction in Melbourne. Brought to you by the South Melbourne Football Club Business Community and sponsored by Site Tech Solutions. There are seven uh, podcasts in total. Six of those are focused in, on property. This one will focus on the key economic trends in what has been an ever-changing world in 2020 and beyond. Uh, and of course, the impact on property and construction. We're very fortunate today to be joined by Peter Monkton, Chief Economist at the Bank of Queensland. And Peter's been with Bank of Queensland for six and a half years now. And prior to that, he worked in consulting and with other leading banks. It is uh, terrific to have someone with such a great depth of knowledge. Uh, and I'm looking forward to sh him sharing his thoughts on what's in store for 2021 and beyond. Peter, welcome to the show. Thanks, Eric. And thanks very much for the invite for coming along. We're very much looking forward to this. Fantastic. So, Peter, before we get started on all the economic trends, I just thought it'd be worth uh, spending a couple of minutes on you and your very interesting background, uh, how you got to be in economics, uh, and uh, I guess a little bit of your your career history. Yeah, thanks, Harry. First time I actually ever heard someone call an economist interesting, but um, I'll take that as a compliment. <laughs> um, so I'm actually from Perth back in the days when you could actually fly over there. Um, so I was... Uh, born there, went to university there, did an economics degree. Why did I do an economics degree? It just seemed to be interesting. Um, you know, the financial, when I went to university, the financial sector was starting to open up. So there are, you know, plenty of opportunities, although not enough opportunities in Perth back in those days. This was the, the Brian Burke sort of thing. And, um, you know, by 1989, 1990, um, sure, so there were less opportunities in Perth. And so I went over to Canberra. Um, this is the time of Paul Keating, and he was – he and Bob Hawke did an outstanding job on the Australian economy. It really was a great time to work um, on the economy. In, in, it was in Canberra in the 1980s into the early 90s. That's where I was. It was, it was very interesting. A lot of great stuff was worked on. Around about 93, I travelled overseas for a while, and uh, you sort of get to realise Canberra's a small place. And so uh, in 94, I decided that um, I wanted to do something different. So I left Canberra to work in the financial sector, first of all, for a place called Bankers Trust, in the 1990s, then for uh, the Commonwealth Bank, uh, but being an economist for most of that time, but also working in their group strategy uh, area for some time. You know, should should we have open more branches or should we expand overseas, that sort of stuff? And then in more recent years, I've done some work with the ANZ, um, Westpac, and uh, as you say, more recently with Bank of Queensland. So been very varied, mainly in the financial sector. Um, this year's an interesting year, one of the more interesting years I've been involved with looking at economics. Well, I think, um, I think, as you say, this year has been an interesting one and so your career is becoming more and more interesting to other people uh, <laughs> as we go through. So given, given that context, Peter, it would be lovely to hear your thoughts on uh, where the economy is at at present. I mean, obviously we've had, I think, one of the most unusual budgets ever uh, just presented recently. Uh, and so can maybe you give us a bit of context on how you see the Australian economy at, at the moment? Yes, it's been unusual, but the whole thing's been unusual, right? Sort of, uh, it's not often that uh, government sort of say uh, the best thing you can do is, stay, is do nothing, stay at home. If, if we go back, you know, as this crisis hit in, in March, um, if you think about some of the big numbers in terms of what people would say would happen to the Australian economy, it was, it was going to be truly shocking. Uh, some people are talking about unemployment rates of 15 to 20%. And these are numbers we haven't seen since the Great Depression. So go back to March, uh, there was big, big worries about what this crisis would do in terms of, you know, obviously people's health, but more generally to the economy. And then to the government's credit, so the Reserve Bank stepped in first, they reduced interest rates, which was a great help. But if you've got interest rates as it was at 0.75%, there's only so much you can do. Usually in recessions, the Reserve Bank reduces interest rates by about four percentage points. If you're at zero point seven five percent, you haven't got four percentage points to work with. So that led, led the government, and in credit to this government, um, pretty quickly they decided that they needed to do a lot. And to give you an idea how much they did, in this June quarter, income in the economy fell eight percent. Now we've never seen that since the Great Depression, so that's a big number, right? We've never seen this sort of, those sorts of numbers. 
if you actually look at household, this is an aggregate, households' incomes, right, it actually rose too. The maximum money, money that could be available to spent actually rose too. Now, some of that was due to banks with mortgage payment holidays. Some of it was due to rent holidays. But a fair bit of that was down to JobKeeper and Seeker. Right? So the government really did cushion a very unusual sort of economic downturn. And importantly, they did it very, very quickly. So the second quarter was a really big, bad one, but it could have been a hell of a lot worse, I suppose, is the key theme of what I'm, what I'm sort of saying. And I spoke about 15 to 20% unemployment rates. Currently, that number's seven. So that's not a good number, but it's about half as bad as what people were saying, right? So that's sort of big ticks uh, to those involved. Now, as we've gone through, we know that three quarters of the Australian economy, basically from about May, started to open up. So the maths just says if three quarters are now spending more money, the third quarter just must be better and a reasonable amount better. And we're starting to see overseas numbers with the third quarter. They've got big GDP increases. We like to see quite a decent um, increase in our numbers. Of course, where <laughs> you are, Eric, and a lot of the listeners are, is in Melbourne, and that's the one quarter that's had a tougher time. So we've got in September quarter, three quarters improving. By December quarter, we will basically get by Christmas time the one quarter of the rest of the Australian economy opening up. So that means the fourth quarter should be good. But the really that's big a, sorry, that's a that's a good point, Peter. The, because it does feel a little bit like main, mainly, I guess, because of the second wave that's come through Victoria. Um, there are certainly some parts of the economy are doing a lot better, some sectors doing a lot better, some geographic regions doing a lot better. Um, so what, what can you tell us, I guess, is sort of the, the current lay of the land as far as where there's momentum in the economy and other parts that have stalled? And how, how bad is it where it's stalled? Well, <clears throat> some places it's, it's completely stalled. So, you know, it's bad. If you, know, if you are in some industries in Melbourne, uh, you're in air transport, you know, what can you do, right? So air transport, for example, in June quarter fell 96%. So uh, that they're big numbers. So there's some air sectors that that have really struggled and, as you say, they've stalled and they're, you know, they're, they're struggling to get any speed at all. So that's some parts of the economy. Uh, more parts of the economy, though, have opened up uh, and have got better. Trying to get a golf buggy these days, you can't because everyone's sort of trying to hit the golf course. So there's some parts that are actually doing pretty well. Um, people sort of say tourism is uh, is struggling. Well, if you actually look at intra-state tourism, obviously outside of Victoria, you actually find that is just going off the charts. People cannot go to Rome, so now all of a sudden they're travelling within their own state. And what businesses are doing is changing their business model. All of a sudden knowing most people are going to turn up between Thursday to Sunday, no one's going to be there Monday to Wednesday, they really skew about what staff they have on, what they actually do on those weekends, et cetera. So businesses have adjusted and adapted. Uh, as much as as much as they possibly can, uh, WA is clearly doing best. You know, obviously, help they've had no cases, iron ores through the roof. Uh, Queensland and South Australia in the middle. Victoria obviously been locked down as it's had it hardest. New South Wales are probably towards the bottom too. The other point I'd make on those last two states, New South Wales, Victoria, they've had a very few very good years. One of the reasons they had the very good years, population growth. Right. They were the two states that benefited, benefited the most. A lot of more people mean you had to build a lot more houses, you had to build a lot more train stations, et cetera, et cetera. Now we know the population growth is going to be slow, perhaps even going uh, negative in terms of the amount of people going back overseas, and that means those two states have been hit hardest from that, and particularly on the construction sector, some those are the two industries. So different states are doing, uh, going different momentum, uh, different industries are going different momentum. We are, as an overall economy, improving the big question, Eric, would you ask me about 2021, will it be strong enough? And uh, that is the really big question. Yeah, I guess uh, that is the big question. And, of course, the impact on the, the economy's finances is relying on it improving. Uh, let, let's, though, just before we uh, dive into the property sector, um, I, you know, reading the uh, news about the rest of the world, the, uh, the virus is having an enormous second wave out there to the point where, I mean, on a daily basis, we're seeing all-time records of uh, new cases, uh, and that's pretty much across the rest of the world uh, with a few exceptions. So how, you know, where at the moment does Australia sit, I guess, against uh, some of these other major economies uh, around, around the world? How do, where do you see us placed? Yeah, it's a good, to me, that, that is the key question. So it's a key, one of the key under, underlying questions of all this sort of stuff. 
what is the path of the virus from here? Because whatever assumptions you're going to make about what governments will do and economies go, that is first and foremost, because after all, that's why we have the crisis. As you mentioned, Eric, uh, it's got a lot worse in Europe. They're having to try and deal with that. They're not dealing with it as they did in March, which has shut down the whole place. They're trying to do it, make it more uh, localised, trying to make restrictions uh, less stringent than they did back then. That's what they're trying to do. We'll have to see what they end up doing. Why are we different? Well, I suppose one of the reasons we're different is we're an island. Right? It's just easier for us to put up the border. So that's the, the first and foremost. The second one is that basically we've got a very good health system. Um, now, the tracking and tracing and stuff is different between states. We know that. But by and large, our health system is really in, in better shape. So I think it's another thing. The third thing why we're in better shape is that compared to Europe and the US, we actually have a younger population. One of the things we know about this virus is that it tends to attack, unfortunately, the older people are more than the younger people. Uh, you know, we're a rich country. Um, so therefore, by and large, we smoke less, uh, which is actually another big thing. But one of the other things is that if you compare to us, to some of the other countries, if the government sort of says what we need to do is this, you know, stay at home, et cetera, et cetera, the proportion of people actually listening is a lot higher than a lot of other countries. You know, some people don't, but the proportion that do is a lot higher. So we're more law-abiding, we're an island, we're healthier, we're quite rich, we smoke less. All those are the reasons I think that we've done uh, a lot better in terms of dealing with the virus and the others. And that leads us in terms of who should do better the next two or three years. If we'll dealt with this better, that gives us a good head start going the next couple of years. It does seem like, uh, as an adjunct to that question, uh, China obviously also got on top of the virus reasonably early and seems to be economically doing quite well. We're quite reliant on China as an economy. Uh, do you see that benefiting uh, Australia in the years to come? Yeah, so China's gone about it another way. So we've tried to do it through, uh, you know, demographic, uh, democratic, um, you know, persuade people ways. Don't try to enforce too many things. Uh, China's gone to some uh, other extent to some extent. Uh, they've also obviously dealt with this very well. I would also say, though, if you look through most Asian countries, right, that's one of the things that stands out. Probably less the case in some like Indonesia and India, but most other Asian countries have actually dealt with this well. I think one of the reasons for that is that, you know, this is not the first big disease outbreak. Over, it's the first one, big one we've had in 100 years. But in Asia, they've had two or three over the last, over that, through that period. And a couple of those have been in the last 20 years. And so they have got used to dealing with the situation. And the most obvious uh, example of that is mask use. And as soon as there's a problem, everyone wears a mask wherever they go, wash their hands, et cetera, right? And so because as a society they're used to dealing with this and as a society they set up their tracking and tracing programs really well, that's the reason why not only China but the wide age society so well. Just in terms of China in particular, there's no doubt at all, that's a big thing for Australia. It's a big thing for the global economy. Exports are only 20% of our economy. 40% of them, though, go to China. Right? And that relationship is the third biggest in the world after US and Canada, US and Mexico. So what happens in China is a big thing for us. The fact its economy is the uh, best performing in the world right now is clearly a big plus for us and obviously particularly for states like WA. Really interesting insights there. So what I hear you saying, Peter, is um, it's tough out there. Um, it's been a really difficult year, but perhaps not as difficult as we first thought it would be. Uh, so let's... I guess, start to focus a little bit on some of the risks that you do see, because there are still lingering risks, of course, with all of this. So where do you see the risks in the economy moving forward in 2021 and beyond? Yeah, so the first one is the point we've just touched on, Eric, and that, that's just the virus. You know, what actually really uh, happens there? You know, if you actually ask people when they know when is a vaccine, because only immunity it really means this comes to the end, when is a vaccine going to be around? Uh, they're sort of saying mid-next year, there's been an increasing amount of good news over the last month that that'll be the case, that basically they will have found one, they would have been able to manufacture it and distribute it by around about mid-next year. In the Federal Treasury and its budget, they assumed by it was going to be around by the end of next year. That's a fair assumption, but that clearly is a very, very, very important assumption. The second part of that one is that basically we've, it feels like forever, right? Particularly you guys down in Melbourne, it feels like forever that basically this has been around. It's been around for six months. And we're talking about mid-next year, we're talking nine months away. And we've had two, two waves in six months of the virus. 
So that must is the third issue, right? Sort of the path of when it ends and the path of when we get there is a really important thing. Um, you mentioned the budget area. That's really important. I mentioned JobKeeper and Seeker about how big that is. Right? What we know from the budget is that big bickies were spent, right? and that is JobSeeker and Keeper. As we know from the end of September, that starts to eke off, and by the end of March, that comes to the end. Where the budget extra bickies come into is tax cuts for households and tax breaks for businesses in, in effect, right? There's a few other things spent, but that was sort of the, the big ones. And so the really other big part of that question is, Will households and businesses actually spend? Because they're getting a whole lot of extra money in the bank account. They've just been through a big shock. Will they have enough confidence to spend? So that's the second uh, really big risk. Uh, if they don't have enough confidence, then governments will have to do more. Now, state budgets will be out towards the end of 2020. I think we'll likely see them spend more. Uh, and the federal government, if they don't, is, is not enough spending in the economy, may have to do more in May, and I, next year, 2021. And I think that's will end up having to be the case. So that's probably the really big one, the uh, saving and spending. Uh, if you actually think about the economy before COVID hit, you know, it was okay, right? The economy was sort of okay, there's no, there's no problem. But was it good? Was it good enough? And really, it wasn't really good enough. And many economists, I, I include myself on this, said at the start of the year before COVID, really, we, our economy needs to be stronger, our unemployment rate needs to be lower, the government should be borrowing more and investing more. That was sort of uh, the big thing. And so that's really the question past mid next year when the budget's finished. Is there enough after that? And I thought that one of the things I would like to see more from the budget was more spending on infrastructure. And I think that's what we may see in May, that the economy will be okay, be better than where we are today, but is it going to be strong enough? And that's why I think the extra push from the government uh, may, may well be needed. Hmm. The other point sort of associated is that, you know, uh, the economy wasn't quite strong enough. It needs more help you know, what will businesses actually have to do to enter this world? Because productivity was a really big issue, how businesses had to evolve. But the part of that is one of the things that businesses are do is investing more in things with big data and artificial intelligence, all this sort of stuff. And where that big question is, Eric, is do people have the skills to work in that new world? Right? And that's sort of the, the other final point, the sort of education system. Are we preparing us people well enough or tomorrow in today's education. So they're probably the things. There's a short-term question about COVID path. There's a question about saving and spending. There's a medium-term question about is our economy going to be strong enough even when we're out of this? And then there's a longer-term question about people's skills. Mm, great. It's going to be very interesting the next couple of months as Christmas approaches to see the spend uh, coming out of households, uh, particularly if the Victorian economy does uh, start to open up the retail sector it'll give us a bit of a sign i guess so so one question around that then uh, relating to business delinquencies we've, we've obviously had the job keeper uh, allowance which have been very generous as you've mentioned there's um quite a significant amount of chatter in the background relating to the fact that we haven't seen a large number of business delinquencies to date however i guess that's not um doesn't provide a lot of certainty moving forward given those incentives are still in place where do you see the situation in relation to business uh, solvency moving forward in, into 2021 yeah, you're absolutely right we've had the biggest recession since the great depression well this is peacetime uh, and the proportion of businesses actually uh, having bankruptcy problems is actually less than last year. So, you know, it doesn't make sense. Why doesn't, as you mentioned, Eric, and as we've already spoken about, the government income support is a big part of that game. Um, the fact that, you know, banks have said you don't have to make mortgage payment uh, for a while is obviously helped very small businesses because quite often they borrow against the house to, uh, you know, to get things going. I think the other part of it is the um, sort of putting on the back burner the insolvency. Sort of, you know, that was uh, put on the back burner for this year, and that go and that may end at the end of this calendar year. So I think all those are reasons about why we haven't seen it. You know, the insolvency stuff will finish, as I spoke about. The income support won't be there. The mortgage payment holidays start stop um, also. And so then the question is: Is the economy going to be strong enough? And you know, if you look at um, the number of businesses sort of saying that their revenue will be increasing next month, that number is still only around about twenty percent of businesses. So, you know, to pick up, we know that they're going to get extra income in their banks from, uh, from the government tax breaks, but is it going to be strong enough by then? So I think the short answer from all this, Eric, is that, first of all, um, we're likely to get an increase in delinquencies just because of all the stuff about the economy is quite weak, the income support stuff is going, et cetera, et cetera. The second one is 
Because though, interest rates are, let's face it, rock bottom, right? So if you've got debt, um, it's quite easily to actually afford to, you know, to, to pay it. Because interest rates are rock bottom and because there's people giving give money in their accounts because of tax breaks, I wouldn't expect the insolvency to be as high as, say, we had in the GFC. Mm-hmm. That's, that would be my view. I suppose then the question is, how much will be? And really that's uncertain because we don't really know the path of the virus. We don't really know, therefore, what the path of the economy will be. Uh, so I think that that's the reason why, if you look what banks have announced over the last three to six months, they've also said, look, we don't really know what's going to happen in terms of how many businesses were a problem. So we're just going to put a whole lot of money back there for provision against that. And I think that's sort of appropriate given the sort of uncertainty about the outlook. Hmm. Yes, can be interesting, isn't it? Uh, our listeners, uh, Peter, are very much in the property construction and infrastructure sector. Um, so if we can spend the last uh, few minutes on, on that uh, sector, because I know they'll be interested to hear your thoughts on how it's going. So what, what would you say as far as how the property construction sector is faring in the economy overall at the moment? Mixed. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, look, I think some parts are probably doing okay. Uh, some parts are really struggling. You know, sort of. Uh, if I was thinking about building a whole lot of inner city units right now, I might, you know, be a little bit concerned about stuff. Uh, on the other hand, if I'm building houses, I'm starting to go a little, a little bit more optimistic. Um, you know, did I, if I'm thinking about uh, having a suburban shopping centre, I might be sort of slightly more optimistic than I've, I'm thinking about building one in the inner city, right? So. Really, it depends upon where you are and I think what you're, um, you're really building. You know, there's no doubt at all that the home builder um, idea uh, program for the government has been very important. If you go back well, even a month ago, but certainly three or four months ago, really everyone was extremely concerned about what would be happening in construction. Um, so home builders really helped out. It's really helped the renovations part. And the other really big part of this is not only what the government's done, but it's just what's happening in the housing sector more generally, right? Sort of, uh, we've seen house prices come off, not very good for existing homeowners, but that with very low interest rates means it's very, very good news for first home buyers. And certainly we've seen uh, the proportion of loans going to first home buyers really pick up, uh, even before COVID, but increasingly so now. And that's obviously helped sort of, um, you know, people buying homes on the on the building homes in the outer suburbs. So I think those things um, you know, are really important in terms of over the next one to three years. Because if you actually go back to just before the GFC, one of the big trends was people leaving home, you know, go out sort of, uh, you know, once you go to university, you left university, you leave home. Then all of a sudden from the GFC on, it, affordability became a real problem. And so more people stayed home for a lot longer. But all of a sudden, these people can start to say, actually, I might be able to afford a home again because of the, you know, reduction in rates and price, et cetera, like that. So that's the sort of good short-term news. Really, I think, Eric, the big issue in the long term for the construction sector is population growth. Now, I touched on this. Population growth this year and next will be its slowest since World War I. Never been as low as this. Big reason is that is that two-thirds of our population growth, and it's been big. I mean, it's been big in recent years. Two-thirds of our population growth at that time has been immigration. And it's highly likely this year we're going to have immigration, i.e. more people leaving than coming here. Right? So the really big question term is what happens to population growth. Now, what the assumption is in the Treasury's budget is that from 2022, the border slowly starts to open. You've seen the federal government start to talk about this. The quicker we can get that to open, the better. Because if we get the immigration growth, there's obviously going to be a you know a couple of years of gap of population. We're not going to be quite as many people in 2030 as we thought we would. But if we get back to where we were, because we've dealt with this virus well, because our economy should be in a better state, then I think our immigration growth will will pick up quite strongly again. But that really is the really big question for the long term. What happens to population growth? Mm, interesting. Well, I've got three teenagers, Peter, so you give me hope that one day they, they might actually <laughs> find a house to move into. Uh, <laughs> The, the other sector is uh, infrastructure, of course, and in the federal budget there was quite a bit of money allocated to infrastructure. We're still waiting on some of the respective state budgets, uh, but the hints coming through seem to be that there's, um, there's going to be a lot of in- investment in infrastructure. What can you tell us about uh, the future for infrastructure, uh, given where we're at? Well, I'd be very surprised it wasn't any but strong. 
So, you know, again, we go through the big picture. We ended this year where basically the economy wasn't quite strong enough. And one of the things that everyone agreed on about we could get a stronger economy if we built infrastructure because more people were employed. But, of course, better infrastructure enables a stronger economy in the future. Right? So that's sort of even before we started. Since we started, that whole thing has just doubled up. Right? We need more people out of jobs, so we need more jobs, so infrastructure gives us that. And since then, uh, interest rates for the government has just almost gone to the floor. So, you know, they've got very low rates, and by a global standard, the government can borrow because it has got a very low debt level. So financing uh, bigger infrastructure spend is not an issue. If you actually look at the pipeline of work already in the infrastructure sector, it's very high, you know, at a very high level. And I think it will remain that way, if anything, get a little bit higher. And in fact, in some places, the question isn't trying to build it up, it's trying to reduce the stock of the, you know, the pipeline just because can they actually get some of the skilled labour that they need, engineers, et cetera. Right. So in some places, it's a, it's a skill problems or a pipeline, a blockage problem. And... I think that if we did have a bigger pipeline of work, then all of a sudden more resources come in that sector, more firms starting opening up, and then we could actually probably, uh, you know, probably get a lot more done. You mentioned um, more in the budget. That's absolutely true. Um, Two dollars in every three in the economy um, spent by governments is by states. Most of the infrastructure spending in the economy is done by states. So I think that um, the state budget is really important. They can only fund so much of it, though, and as you say, the feds will have to help out in that. If I was going to sort of say one thing I wanted to see a little bit more of, and I touched this earlier on in the budget, was it would have been nice to see even more infrastructure spending, not so much this financial year, but in the following two or three years. And I'm hoping to sort of see that in May because that would get us back to the sort of questions we were addressing for pre-COVID, you know, getting our economy stronger and all those sorts of things. So I think that's... All very important. I think we need more infrastructure spending. It's already a very high level. I think we're likely to get that. The three final points I just want to uh, finish up on. One is that we're doing all these great infrastructure projects, right? not only in Victoria but in all the other states. Wouldn't it be good if we became renowned for doing these really well? Pro projects done on time, on budget. Right? So if we're doing a lot of them, let's get good at it because that can actually give us a comparative advantage and we might be able to be an exporter of that. So I think that would be a, a really good thing. The second thing is actually uh, use our existing infrastructure a whole lot better. You know, um, you know, do we actually need all the roads and so forth if we actually have better trains, all that type of stuff? So having a better think about how we do those things better. And the third thing what we could do more spending on, and maybe this will see more of this in the state budgets, is actually maintain our infrastructure better. Do we actually mm -hmm. spend enough money on keeping up on our roads and our trains and all those sorts of things? So I think that's the other thing that's um, – and the good thing about that, of course – is that infrastructure projects can take forever to get on board. Maintaining it, you can actually do it and start doing tomorrow. So I think that's um, the big picture. I think infrastructure is big right now. More money, a lot of money has been spent. I think we'll find out a lot more most money will be spent in the next few years. Mm, good points. And I guess uh, for future generations, if we're spending the money that's borrowed on infrastructure, at least they get to share in the spoils of that and their children do as well. It's always a good... All right, but well, one final question, Peter, uh, regards to access to capital. There's, um, the banks have obviously been through a royal commission. Um, you know, we've seen recent government uh, discussions around uh, making life a bit easier in terms of um, capital. What can you tell us about access to capital uh, moving forward with the virus and, I guess, as we, as we start to get to the end of that uh, period? Yeah, so, Eric, I think probably the biggest um, issue right now is actually not so much sort of banks, you know, supplying of funds. It's actually just the demand for funds. You know, I touched on earlier on about uh, businesses and their revenue growth and the spend and save stuff. If a lot of them are saving, they're not going to be borrowing anyway. So I think from an economy standpoint, the biggest question we face is the demand for funds is not there just because the confidence is not high enough to spend. So that's what if we get the confidence high enough to spend, then all of a sudden the biggest issue becomes a sort of, you know, um, bank lending standards and all that sort of thing. So the first point is sort of the economy, confidence and so forth. That's also my second point because one of the biggest issues for banks is what's the economic outlook? Because obviously the economic outlook is really good, more firms can actually pay back um, their debt and so forth. So the stronger the economy is, the more comfortable banks will be able to lend. And if you actually look at um, recent business surveys, what they've seen is, I mentioned at the start, the economy was getting better. And what we've seen over that period of time, last two or three months, that banks' confidence to lend, or at least business, what businesses are saying, is, is improving. 
So as the economy's got stronger, then banks have got, got more confident anyway to lend. So first one is the demand for funds. The second one is the better economy means there's a better supply of funds. As you noted, uh, you know, sort of there's been this whole question about royal commissions and lending stamps and so forth. The government made an announcement, was it, a few weeks ago about um, improving that in terms of reducing the amount of information that banks need to record, uh, get and so forth, so making it easier. That outcome of what the government suggested will take a while for us to, uh, to, to see. Now, first of all, it's a suggestion. It's actually not legislation. Uh, the second of all, it has to negotiate to get through the Senate. As I understand it, neither the Labor or Greens agree with that, so he's going to rely on sort of smaller parties to agree. So what the outcome will be will take us um, you know, a, a fair while to actually see. So the bigger picture is uh, as the economy improves, more people want funds. As the economy improves, the banks will be happy to lend. And that other issue about how what government regulations will be will take us a while to actually uh, see. The final point I'll just mention is that, you know, the big picture is it's probably been a little bit harder for smaller firms to get money over long term than, than bigger companies, just because particularly in economic downturns, small firms tend to be harder hit. And hopefully the sort of stuff I've spoken about, stronger economy will help out there. There's a lot of focus always on debt. Right? Even before COVID, it was around about sort of, uh, you know, 12% of small companies couldn't get funds, only 5% of big companies. So debt is a bit of an issue. And for some small firms, it's a bigger issue. Equity is less of an issue, but still companies look for equity financing. And the interesting thing is 40% of companies, regardless of size, couldn't get a hold of equity finance. So there's no doubt at all making it easier to get financing and debt is something we need to focus on. And Hence the government's uh, announcement. But also on the equity side, there seems to be more companies struggling to get good equity financing. And that's perhaps something else that um, people can think about. Fantastic. Well, Peter, thank you so much. Uh, on behalf of the listeners, the people that are listening to this are, are, are really looking to get insights into why the economy is operating the way it is. And uh, what a perfect segue uh, for uh, to have you join the show. So uh, thank you very much for your time uh, and all the best uh, moving for, through the, uh, the trials and the turbulation of the, um, uh, of the COVID virus and beyond. So I appreciate your time, uh, Peter. Thanks, Eric, and thanks again very much for the invite. All the best. Cheers.